You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Happy New Year, Danielle. Happy New Year, Jim. Danielle, China appears to be in meltdown mode. For the second time in a week, they've halted trading. It only took them a few minutes into the trading day to, to pull the plug. What is that telling us? Well, it's, it's a huge warning sign to anybody who thinks there's anything sort of uh, organic or legitimate or trustworthy going on in Chinese stock market. I mean, we've known for a long time it was a massive Ponzi full of, um, you know, wild speculation, huge margin use, huge leverage, just a house of cards. I mean, I think the P.E. gym on the uh, Shanghai Exchange has been about 70 in the, in the last uh, you know, year or so. So that just gives you some indication of the price pressure, the the uh, risk to the downside. I mean, that's up in the territory of the Nasdaq at the at the bubble peak. You know, um, so it was frothy. It was wrought for a massive decline, and indeed that began, you know, over the last year. But um, policymakers, you know, China took a lot of notes from the Western central banks. Uh, where they've stepped in to try and stop the asset corrections from happening all over the world, and China has been doing the same. But, you know, to no avail, because all they do is terrify people all that much more. When when people realize that it is not a liquid, available, good-as-cash kind of marketplace, which is what people realize in these crisis moments, whether it is in hedge funds that have to freeze redemptions and you can't get capital back, whether it's in... Um, poor liquidity in developed markets. You know, we've been commenting for a long time that the amount of volume and legitimate trading going on in um, developed markets was painfully slow and, and, and low and that there was a lot of this HFT going on and, you know, vapid trades that weren't actually trades, just sort of rapid rapid fire stuff. All that's been happening all over the world. So anyway, as long as people realize or believe that that's, you know, legitimate or that they can sell at any moment or they can get their cash back whenever they feel like it, the belief continues. But as soon as there's a revelation that it is a Ponzi, it isn't as good as cash, it's highly speculative, it's dangerous, and it can shut for days at a time, once people realize that, the panic actually builds further. So the Chinese are trying to suppress panic and try and control something that's uncontrollable because it's driven by the human animal and in our behavior. And so, um, you know, no one was closing it when it was going up to that 70 PE. Did you notice that, Jim? When it was galloping higher, you know, week after week and in insane bubble territory, no one's, nary a word was said, right? No complaints, no concerns, nobody ever commenting that, gee, this might be unsustainable or dangerous. But now that the mean reversion begins, everybody is outraged and trying to demand, you know, demand action. Stop it. Stop it from falling. It's actually, a, it's comical. Well, I was going to say, Danielle, perhaps you haven't been listening to the guests that I have on all the time. For the past six months, I would say a year, they've been warning, look, this is a house of cards. It's going to come tumbling down. Don't be, you know, sucked in by what I call the yell and sellers on the business news television shows is that, look, there's no real value there. And the so-called fangs are the only ones leading. And now the fangs right now are getting bitten on the butt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the bulk of the uh, shares, even in the North American market and the S&P, which has held up remarkably well over the past couple of years, um, as other things began to turn down, um, the bulk of the stocks that trade are actually already in a bear market. It's just that handful of really popular, what we call hedge fund motels. Um, you know, the hedge funds are attracted into these names like Netflix and Apple and all the popular sort of popular uh, culture ones almost, the ones that the households are aware of. Um, and uh, everybody was making bets on those sort of uh, hot stocks, if you will. And that is really why the carnage really is magnified because everyone's into those things all at the same time just as the implosion begins. And it starts, it's like a ripple. It starts in emerging markets. It starts in, 
you know, the weaker companies, and it spreads. And because of the leverage, everything's connected. So selling in in one market or in several markets begat selling in others, and then there's forced liquidation across the board. So that's what um, is unfolding right now. It's a function of not just things like the Fed beginning or tightening cycle. That's maybe one more sort of grain of sand on the teeter-totter towards panic because people are realizing that, you know, they're trying to supposedly, you know, uh, the economy's all healed, right? They're, they've a mission accomplished. Now we can go back to tightening and everyone's panicking and realizing that it's been this great farce all along. The financial markets got so far ahead of what was going on in the real world economy or anything organic that was happening with revenue and companies. And because of that, now, you know, the reaction is extremely violent to the downside on the on the financial markets and you'll hear economists and people saying, listen guys, there's no reason to react this way. Everything's not that much different than it was and we're going to have growth but it won't be fast growth but we knew that. There's nothing new in this but you see no one again was saying when markets were overshooting and overpricing and going to ridiculous PE levels, you know, and the S&P at 26 and all this in the past couple of years, no one was coming out and saying, geez guys, be careful because the Financial markets are overshooting. They're they're being unreasonable. You know they're they're magnifying what's potentially going to happen here too much. No one was saying that on the way up, but now on the way down, everyone's trying to discount it. So I think it's just the end of a very treacherous cycle of huge leverage. You know, went to see the big short over the holidays. Don't know if you got to see it yet, Jim. I'd recommend it to everyone. Everyone that has savings to lose, as I like to say owes it to themselves to go to that movie and try and comprehend because they have laid it out in such a user-friendly, entertaining manner to keep, you know, the the regular folks with them as they take us through this, uh, how we got the credit bubble that built into 2008, what happened in the implosion, and most importantly, what has not been fixed since. So today, for example, you see George Soros is quoted in the media as doing a talk in Sri Lanka this week saying, you know, it's just a a resumption of the 2008 crisis. And that's how I've characterized it all along, too. It's not that this is a new crisis. It's the same old beast, except this time we've got trillions more in debt and leverage, a lot more junk on the books of most corporations, as well as over-indebted households and governments. Um, and, you know, here's the thing. People, I saw, um, I think it was David Rosenberg was on Bloomberg uh, in the last day or so talking about, you know, how he disagrees that it's not so bad to the downside and, you know, we really shouldn't be overreacting and all this sort of thing. And China's not going to be, you know, no hard landing in China. Well, the reality is their stock market's having a hard landing. And I think that's the thing that people have to understand. There's a profound difference between what goes on from an organic sort of rational basis in terms of growth in the economy and what goes on in financial markets. And the more leverage and the more intervention from central planners and governments, the more whacked out that gets, right? So I was looking at, you know, Gluskin Chef's performance in the last year and a half, and lo and behold, their shares are down already, you know, something like 37% and change since um, April of 2014, which doesn't surprise me because they're the typical sort of buy and hold you know, they had a huge weight on in Canada. They were running around with the Canadian flag wrapped around them in the U.S. a few years ago, you know, telling everyone how wonderful Canada is, how great the U.S., the Canadian dollar is, how fantastic the commodity story is. And, of course, none of that was true. It was all exactly the wrong thing to be saying, attracting people in for the wrong reasons at that time. And so, um, of course, now, because no one was proactive in warning people about the risks when things were overblown, now they're running around trying to pretend they that this isn't happening, that this mean reversion is unreasonable. In fact, the unreasonable part was what went over, say, from 2011 to 14 on the QE mania. That was the unreasonable part, and that's what set us up for what's happening right now. So really, this is just the truth coming out a bit more. This is just revelation of reality about valuations, and it always comes back to this, Jim. It always does. It's just that it can really test your patience. If you're someone who is actually taking objective measurements and you do have a neutral or unbiased position, like you can talk about things when they're overvalued and say they're dangerous as opposed to the masses and most financial businesses who are always holding people in, into these things no matter what the valuation so they can collect their fees. And, you know, very few of us have this neutral um, approach where we aren't mandated to keep people in any of these assets. 
uh, those of us who could do that were taking measurements all along and knew this was a crazy time and it would end. So it's kind of a relief, frankly, to see it again because you always knew it would take place, um, that the truth would come back out, but it, you know, you never know exactly how long it's going to take in the mania phase. Well, Dalton, yeah, you, know, you were the first to point out, I think, that don't forget the TSE hadn't even got up to the levels it had hit in 2008 before it crashed. Uh, in this particular trading period, so don't be so surprised that you know the value is is falling away now because it never got back to you know, zero. Well, actually, what happened was it surpassed its prior peak, its 08 peak. It surpassed it in 2011 on the you know the crazy stuff that was going on. It got up to that 15.5 range when everyone see what happened was the QE stuff reinvigorated the animal spirits in the commodity space and in the belief that China, with its massive stimulus package, could pull the rest of the world forward through the Great Recession. So the belief um, was spread mostly by the long always folks who had lost everyone money in the 0809 collapse. So they were pumping this story, don't worry, it's all good, it's all bouncing back, and the central banks of the world were throwing trillions of dollars at that to sort of buy by belief, let's put it that way. So the TSX rallied strong into 2011. And remember back then, Jim, everyone thought Canada was this wonderkind, right? We were this story of resilience and, you know, our banking, our banks were strong and we weren't as over levered going into the downturn. We bounced back quickly on the commodity story. Everyone had an unfounded overconfidence in Canada and the strength of our economy and our currency and all that. And so what happened was everything got quickly repriced higher, too high to, to be anything realistic, and then we've been getting it right in the chops ever since. So it's incredible, but the commodities, uh, it, the Goldman Sachs Commodities Index, Jim, is now back at the level it was in 1970s. So when people say that you can't time these things or that you shouldn't time, try and time your exposure to these uh, these market cycles, they are talking either because they have no method or, or discipline to offer, so they're basically order takers that have no value or discipline to offer people for risk management, or they're on the side that has to get hold people to the fire in order to collect their fees. And that's the bulk of the industry. Because if people were to take profits, were to move to cash, were to go to GICs or short-term government bonds, their revenue for the sell side goes to virtually net nil. Or very little, and so they they simply cannot tolerate people understanding that. So they have to keep people buying at all times, and that's why they that's why they do such harm. You know, it's it's why they uh, inflict damage on their clients over full market cycles every time, and especially during a secular bear. As I've been saying, it is secular bear since 2000 when valuations went to ridiculous levels in the tech wreck. This is our third bubble peak was the QE mania. The second was the housing commodities bubble in 2007-8. Now we're in the third one. This downturn is likely to uh, retest the 09 lows on many of the major markets. And um, it already has for materials and, and uh, energy and you know gold shares, all that is already below where it was in 09. And as I say, in the commodities price cycle, back to where it was in the 70s. So you have got to understand that dynamic. You've got to understand where we are in the secular cycle and also what to do to protect yourself in the downturns that happen, the, the bear markets that come. And um, if you don't, then you ought not to be trying to invest in these markets. They are treacherous places, and humans do not have enough time to recoup losses uh, when they lose a huge chunk of their capital. The, the time frame just makes no sense in real life. What about the trading robots? Have they just made the situation worse? Uh, well, the trading robots, as in the uh, the high frequency trading, yes, it's out of control. It's ludicrous. It has nothing to do with investing. There's no defensible case that can be made. Although the money uh, is controlling the policy right now and buying the academics to do studies, you know, the people that are raking in billions have bought a bunch of reports and studies to say that it's in the public's best interest to have this kind of nonsense going on. That's all wrong. It's 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 completely. Uh, erroneous and um, luckily there's a lot of people on the front line that know that that are extremely versed in what's going on are, are tracking it day after day after day and are sending you know to the SEC and any regulator that has a mandate to watch this stuff there's private citizens 
who are sending page after page and snapshot after sna- snapshot of actual flash crashes and spoofing and front running and all these illegal activities that have been going on over the past several years, but they're being captured and logged and documented and published on the internet, people on Twitter, and they're, they're mocking those who are trying to, you know, profess this is somehow normal or safe or good. And I think eventually this is all coming to a head. You know, we're coming to another presidential election in the United States. This is going to be a massive uh, issue as it was in 2008 because the, the markets are, you know, losing, imploding trillions of dollars here as we go, which was, as I say, this bubble farce over the past few years. But the timing of this coming in the presidential election, coming at a time when people are, um, you know, increasingly disenchanted with this whole idea of, you know, mainstream economics and financial advisors and, you know, all the rhetoric that people have heard for the last 16 years that has hurt them repeatedly. Their tolerance for this is much lower at the same time that there simply isn't enough debt available or extra leverage that one can add to this system. We've really sickened the whole thing with that, that, that drug already. And I think that that's why we're setting up for a cathartic moment, and that encourages me. I think, you know, the last election cycle, Obama had it in his hand. He was handed the mandate. He could have made a change to the foundation if he'd wanted, but he didn't see that as his calling. He missed it completely. That was a huge failure of his leadership, in my view. But I think that the next election, whether it's Bernie Sanders, whether he's, you know, uh, even as a VP on, on the Democratic's ticket or whatever, he's bringing that discussion into the, into the, the political discourse. And I think that people are starting to line up behind that again and say, hey, you know, our pensions are bankrupt and executives have got rich and everybody else is poorer. And again, that's why the timing of the big short to come out at this particular time and speak to the general public and make it so, you know, obvious that there's been a huge coup d'etat here, a great robbing of, of the public's uh, coffers, and that this time around I'd be very surprised if it gets to go that way again. We shall see, won't we? Well, uh, the first business day of the new year, they always do that story. By noon, the average CEO has already made more money than you will in a year. Yeah, and you know, I am certainly not anyone who begrudges people who work hard and add value and you know have creative uh inputs and are able to make uh a good a good living on that. I there's no there's no none of that about, you know, hating wealthy people or none of that. But the truth is it's completely unfair the way the current system has worked. And it is not a meritocracy. It has not rewarded the people that have added, you know, that have created business. It's added these it's rewarded these people who come in to an a going concern run it into the ground, rob it blind, and leave it worse than they got there. You know, that is not the entrepreneurs of the world that have created value. So uh, that's that's the executive class that has been created by this financial bubble that we've engendered for the last 16 years, the central banks and the, and the uh, credit appetite that has allowed the world to get off on this very unproductive, damaging course, which is now mean reverting. So, you know, I called our, our our year-end newsletter to our clients was good things come. You know, happy new year, good things come. Because we made positive returns through 15. We're making positive returns as all this is happening. And, you know, this is what comes to the people. This time is the reward that comes to the people who who don't get sucked in to the Ponzi on the way up, who have a discipline, who can control their behavior and keep their cash liquid and keep doing the same disciplined, humble things every day while the masses go mad. And then they're the ones who are able to deploy that capital and buy things when value presents again. And I think we're moving toward that now. And it could be the third and final one of this secular bear that began in 2000. And it typically has lasted 17 to 20 years. I think it's possible we could get a very important bottom in equity markets over the next year. And then potentially you could have sideways markets for a year or two after that where not much happens. But that's what happened in 1980. You had an important bottom in the stock market in 1980, not much recovery in 82, but what happened was earnings began to recover. And so because prices remained relatively flat, price-to-earnings ratios actually moved lower from 1980 to 82, not because price moved lower, but because earnings moved up and price stayed flat. 
And that's what presented the best valuations in a generation in 1982, ultimately, and the start of the next big secular bull market that took off from then until 1999. So all this is sort of setting us up for that next big boom phase. But first, we have to have the massive clean out of all the junk and the, you know, roundup of the crooks and the clean up of the markets and the taking out of the unfair advantage. And that's a very cathartic process, as I say. And I'm, I'm very grateful that we seem to be started into it again. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after the break. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel. Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, Saturday, January 9th at the Alex Goulden Hall. Buy online and save at ontourtickets.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, with the meltdown on the equity markets, what's that going to do to the really boiling hot real estate markets in Vancouver and Toronto? I think the two main factors that have been at work in Vancouver and Toronto have been, number one, a direct connection to the finance business, which is predominantly in those two capitals. And that's where, as I say, this gross enrichment, over-enrichment, unfair enrichment has happened to the underwriters, the broker-dealers, you know, that kind of cohort, and they tend to live in those centers. So it's like New York. If you look at New York and London as well, if you look at the statistics, the high-end properties were having big gains over the last year, even as the more lower-end properties began to slow. And that's because, you know, some of these people have such, you know, excess capital flooding around that they plop it in different spots. The same things happen for foreign investors. So foreign investors leaving places like China have looked for homes for their capital diversity, you know, parking in other places where they hope it will hold its value. Now, here's a very fascinating thing that's happened, right? So a lot of people in Canada and other countries, when the U.S. market, U.S. housing market uh, had its big 50% decline uh, in many of the hot spots in uh, 2006, Jim, it went from being extremely overvalued in 2006 to being fair valued into 2009, 10, 11 in that, in that period. And so a lot of people, Canadians especially, because we had strong currency, don't forget the U.S. dollar was weak at that time as against most of the global currencies. So people had two things going for them there. Foreigners could go in and buy uh, lower U.S. properties with a strong currency. And they purchased, and that happened in with foreigners coming to Canada as well. So you had a lot of that money buying up our realty and raising our prices. The trouble then comes when currency starts to have violent swings. So, for example, the Canadian market, the Canadian dollar having the big decline, now more than 37% lower as against the U.S. dollar, um, people now who had bought those properties low, for example, the Canadians, are struggling with the fact that they are fixed costs now on those properties that have become 35 37% more expensive in a matter of a year and a half. So now I think the pressure starts to go the other way. Similarly, in country, in, in cities like Toronto and Vancouver, where foreigners had come in and bought on the assumption of a stable Canadian dollar, attracted to that stability in particular as a place to park capital, what they start to notice is that in respect to their own currency, the Canadian dollar has weakened significantly. And so now they, they say, you know, geez, I've parked it there for safety and it's dropping like a stone in terms of value. Um, um, translated back. So that starts to bring pressure. It's just another factor for people to start looking to sell these properties. And I think that may be the final tipping point in these hot spots. So number one, the finance sector in distress again, which they tend to be highly levered that crowd. So they buy lots of things on, on mortgages. They buy lots of properties with debt. They buy lots of fancy cars on lease. You know, even though you'd think, geez, they got cash. Why would they do that? Well, because they're overly confident at all times in the up cycle. And then what happens in the down cycle is they can't make their payments. They start to have big losses in their income. Um, they start getting sued, all sorts of good stuff. And then they start looking to sell things. So I think you've got the, the foreigners uh, not happy about currency mean reversion in Canada that are going to start looking to sell or have started to sell. I think you're going to have the same exodus out of some of the U.S. property markets for the very same reasons, because not just Canadians who bought there are starting to find the expenses intolerably high, right? Other countries, other foreigners who, who put in there are saying, geez, my expenses are so so much now, at the very same time the tourists are less inclined to travel to the United States. 
because they're finding it too expensive, right? So there's so you've got all these people thinking, geez, let's sell these properties now. We bought low, let's sell high for the U.S. dollar. And uh, also, you know, gee, we can't find renters as easily as we needed to or wanted to to cover these increased costs. So I think all this starts to, this is where you get this bleed over from the financial markets, the equity and corporate debt markets into the realty markets. And there's a very close correlation there, as was pointed out by Robert Frank in his, you know, spectacular book that came out in, I think, 2009, The High Beta Rich. I've told people you should read it. It's a fantastic book, but it shows the dramatic correlation between all these things that I'm talking about and why price cycles tend to now move all together. Back in the old days, you may have had, you know, one going up while the other was going down sort of thing, and you could go from one to the other. Today, you have a high degree of correlation amongst all these things. They all go up together, and they all come down together. Danielle, it sounds like it's going to be a very interesting year. Yeah, really interesting. That's I love it when truth comes out because then you're actually dealing with math and things you can, you know, make some reasonable judgments about. And I think that that's what's coming back into vogue here. So that's a good thing. Thanks again for chatting with us. My pleasure. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Her website is jugglingdynamite.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. You can forward comments about the show to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.